I seem to have had an audio problem right there. Are you hearing me now? Okay. Well, it's a live show, folks, so anything can happen. So uh, buckle up and uh, just try to keep up with the pace. Had a little problem with my mic there, but let's just keep rolling. Uh, what was I saying? Probably something great about our next guests. Today, we're talking transitions with two amazing guests from the Honor Foundation, a career transition program for U.S. Special Operations Forces that effectively translates their elite military service to the private sector and helps create next gener the next generation of corporate and community leaders. Uh, our first guest spent more than 28 years serving his country in the U.S. Navy Special Warfare and Special Operations. That's right, the illustrious Navy SEALs. His career culminated with promotion and five years service as a Command Master Chief and his inevitable retirement in 2019. Since then, he's been an executive coach, uh, a CEO, and even a podcast host. For the last three years, he's been working with the Honor Foundation, helping his fellow operators successfully transition to civilian life. Uh, by his side today, a longtime male spouse and human resources professional. So it's safe to say she understands a thing or two about the challenges of transitioning from military service to civilian employment. She's the vice president of people for the Honor Foundation, where she's been building relationships with employer partners, leading the global executive mentorship program and co creating compelling events that advance the Honor Foundation's mission. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me today in welcoming Bob Newman and Lindsay Cashin. Bob, Lindsay, welcome to the show. Lucas, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Hey, right. Lucas. Hey, Lindsay. I'm, I'm glad you guys could carve out some time to be with us today. Uh, hey, folks out there in internet land, uh, now that you know who we are, let's hear who, who you are, all right? Um, where are you? Who are you with? Are you transitioning? Are you retiring? Uh, are you a mill spouse? Are you a veteran, a reservist, National Guard? Uh, any combination therein, we want to hear who you are, and, and we want to hear your questions, comments, issues, and concern. And uh, time allowing, we'll get after them. And, and thanks to my commenters right out of the gate for identifying that my headset wasn't working. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bob, uh, Lindsay, uh, before we get into questions and answers, uh, I'd really like to hear about your personal experiences, uh, your individual experiences within the military community and your transition uh, to the civilian world. Uh, Lindsay, why don't you go first? Yeah, so it, it's great to be here and I'm kind of excited to hit it from two folds as a military spouse and as somebody now who serves this community and the men and women who are transitioning out. But my background is, you know, born and raised in New York City. I thought I was going to, you know, make it big and, and work in Manhattan. And uh, lo and behold, I, I meet my husband and he makes me move to Southern California. Uh, my husband's been in the Marine Corps for going on 28 years from the conventional side, joint side, soft side, um, and you name it. So we've, we've had a wonderful and, and amazing life. Um, my background was always in HR. So what uh, I found that I had to adjust and really create a new norm and a new life for me as a military spouse and find the new job and, and find the new group of friends and, and tribe members who could support me in my journeys. I had to learn how to be a, a full-time working mom and a supportive spouse to my husband and, and what his career was. So I love conversations like today because I just think that the military community and the spouses provide such an incredible talent lens to companies that it is it is truly a passion of mine. And I came to THF um, almost three years ago because I, I found such purpose in what their mission was for the community and, and their family. So, so excited to be here. Thanks for the time today. Excited. And I'm excited I get to work with Bob every day too. So his story is amazing. Um, he is one of many who inspire me to what we do. So Bob, I'm going to let you do your intro too. Yeah. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Yeah. So I, I came from humble beginnings. I grew up in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, my father owned a food wholesaler and most of the men in my family had served in the military. So I knew at a young age that uh, I wasn't going to be continuing on to college because I was basically my background was I was majoring in juvenile delinquency. Um, so the military was certainly a responsible path for me other than college. And my dad had introduced me into, uh, he had a number of SEALs going through jump school with him in 1965. And that's kind of, I heard those stories. My father was actually in the photograph uh, right there in Vietnam. Um, and so I enlisted at 17 for the SEAL teams. And as you kind of went over my career there, the interesting part of my transition and background was, is I spent a number of years as an operator. And then you know, I think for me, the benefit was as a senior executive, you know, command master chief level, you know, for the last five years and then actually kind of flying a desk that 
the entire last eight years of my career, I was starting my transition sort of at the tail end of my career, as it were. You know, so for someone like me, I think the transition is a little bit of a different scope than a lot of the military folks that are getting out after a four year, you know, or 12 year stint, something of that nature. But thanks again, Lucas, really grateful to be here and looking forward to sharing our story today. Oh, fantastic. Bob and Lindsay, thank you very much. Uh, OK, so let's dive right in. Uh, many veterans and male spouses alike find the transition can be a lonely experience. Uh, they go from a structured environment surrounded by hundreds or thousands of people who speak their language, understand their culture, understand their experience, and generally support each other during difficult times like deployments. Our service members have a singular focus, a critical mission, and the support that mill spouses provide is actually vital uh, to the members of our team. Once they tr transition, though, some find uh, it, it, it all, it's all gone. It evaporates. Uh, your, your tribe, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your colleagues, your bosses, your subordinate, it's all gone like that in the rearview mirror. Uh, why is it important, even critical, uh, to the well-being of service members and spouses alike uh, as they go out into the civilian world to find their tribe? Uh, Lindsay, take us up. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a full holistic approach to it. You know, the, the mind, body and spirit of finding those like-minded individuals, the, the commonalities that you've had throughout a, a life of service, and then making sure that you, you're going to remain in contact with them for those encouraging moments, those sounding boards, the help, the guidance. I think it's really important that you have to embrace the relationships that you've developed. Um, you know, whether it's a spouse, you know, I'm going to date myself here, like going back to the, the key volunteer tribes that we used to have. Um, the key link groups. Um, mm -hmm. Just because you're leaving, it doesn't mean that you're negating those relationships and you're negating those friendships that you've made along the way, because those are really guiding you on where you're going and, and what you're going to be able to do. So I think the tribe right now is critically important when you look at just the, the mental health of individuals too. They are a part of what your happiness and your fulfillment is going to be. So there's a lot of self-imposed obstacles we have to overcome too. being willing and vulnerable to reach back out, um, have those touch points and saying, I want to talk. I want to throw an idea past you. What do you think? You know me very well. Um, and I think it's twofold that you also have to consider that for the service member. Um, I can't speak to the team experience like Bob can. I can only speak to the spouse experience that it's always valuable and it's a phone call or a text message away to be able to make a great impact on somebody. So finding those tribes, critically important and remaining in touch with those tribes that you're already a part of. That's, that's my gut right now. Um, Bob, take it. Yeah. Over. I'll come no, back. I absolutely agree, Lindsay. And, you know, you shared a few, you know, insights there, especially being vulnerable. And I think what's so important about the tribe is like, stay in touch with your veteran friends, your community, you know, the people that you served with that made an impact on you and helped mentor you, or, Hey, maybe you help mentor and guide. I mean, I get feedback from folks or asked, you know, all, especially since I'm working with the honor foundation. Now I get hit up by all the time by folks that I worked with. And that's so fulfilling to me, but your tribe is not your identity. Your veteran is mm. something we do. It's a stable part of our foundation. You know, I've, I served since I was 18 years old, you know, all of my adult life in the military, but I don't see that as my identity anymore. And what are our tribes? Our tribes are the people that we rely on and that they rely on us. You know, so your family is part of your tribe. You will find other activities that inspire you, that can give you a sense of purpose. Those things can be your tribe. And, you know, I, I think really to be fulfilling post-military service, whether it was one tour or you got out after a 30-year career, is to identify yourself in, in a vocation, a profession that you can identify as a tribe. Those people that you trust and rely upon and they rely upon on you. And they're helping us drive that sense of purpose. You know, one of the things we talk with the INR Foundation is when you when you go to that next career and you're going through the interview process with those companies, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. And that is a really important part of you feeling connected to that relationship that you're going to build with them. Yeah. And I think the important part to that is, you know, as you're transitioning, the tribes that you want to become a part of and have that network it really is your choice and it's your preference and it's, you know, where are you going to have that spark of passion? And those oh, absolutely. So I think it's, it's critically important to consider others. Like Bob said, Bob, I think you actually told me in a conversation that you had like five tribes. Yeah. I mean, so like I have goals, you know, I'm very goal oriented. I'm not always successful at those goals. And that's part of like, you know, you know, fail forward. Right. And learn from them. But yeah, so I've always got some sort of personal 
goal that I'm supposed to achieve. Like I'm actually supposed to be on Mount Rainier this week climbing, but since I tore my bicep and I have some other things. So I have like an active tribe that I'm always excuses. Yeah. (laughs) Cycling, you know, those activities that I like that fulfill me, maybe help my mental health and my physical fitness. And again, I mentioned my family. Then I have my team, right? Like right here at the Honor Foundation, we are part of a team. It's one of the reasons that kind of got me back into this environment is the people that I work with are amazing. Um, and then I have like an extended group of people where we check in with one another, you know, and that is my, that is my post-military service tribe. You know, we get together for cups of coffee. I've got a group of friends that check in on me from time to time. And that sort of perpetuates that sort of feeling like you're still belonging to something important and that we're there. We've got each other's backs. And, you know, in today's environment, I mean, we, it's not always talked about, but you hear about it a lot is the mental health aspect Mm -hmm. of transition. Um, And it really is, is a real thing. And I'm so touched when I have teammates reaching back out to me and just checking on me, make sure I'm okay. Especially when they know I'm struggling, you know, that's awesome, Bob. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, and I feel that, you know, get out into your community. Uh, You're leaving one community, get into another one. Maybe that's a church group. Maybe that's, a fraternal organization. Maybe that's a veterans group. Maybe that's a VSO that you want to you know, donate your time to, but uh, you know, sitting in the house and uh, looking at your DD 214 and, and wishing you had had more time or been to another school or gotten that last promotion. It's not getting you anywhere. All right. Get out and find some folks just like you and, and live life. I want to talk for a second about networking very much uh, linked to that idea of finding your tribe. Everyone tells me that networking is critical to a successful transition. It's critical to finding good employment. It's critical. It's critical. It's critical. Why is this so true? And how should our transitioning service service members and spouses be executing? Yeah. Uh, I'll take the spouse part, Bob, if you want first. Sure. Uh, you know, LinkedIn is a, a fantastic tool. All the social media tools are uh, outstanding when it comes to finding individuals to learn from. And I think that's the first part of anybody navigating a life change is finding individuals who you want to learn from. You want to explore what a career may be, um, what a company may be, and take the time and, and make a deliberate effort to do so. So I say LinkedIn is the number one networking tool right now that you have to utilize. And sometimes it's very difficult because for a spouse, if there's been career gaps and and years where you're not employed, it's what am I putting on that gap? And I say, embrace all of those life experiences that the military community has provided you. Um, Volunteer activities that you may do at a church or a school in the local communities with other nonprofits. There's always an inspiring moment in your story that you're going to connect with somebody. And then it just grows exponentially, the networking that you can do from there. But I also think from the networking lens, why it's so critically important is because it really is your foundation to developing relationships. Um, I like to say it's not the size of your network. It's really the net worth of it, the individuals and the relationships that you have in it, that you could send a message, send an email, get their phone number and be able to reach out and get some sound advice and guidance along the way. I love it, Lindsay. Bob, yeah. what's your take? I, I love that net worth of your network. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, for a lot of us in the military, we're not comfortable talking about ourselves. Um, we're not comfortable talking about our experiences in the military, you know, dare I say, seeming sort of, unhum- you know, unhumble. But you've got to come over that. You've, you've got to overcome that instinct. Um and get out there and kind of be vulnerable, tell your story, get to know people and build those relationships. Every opportunity that I've had prior to my transition and all throughout my transition have been through relationships. Um, and as, as Lindsay mentioned, LinkedIn is your intelligence gathering device in, in a platform that's right in front of you every day. If you want to learn about a business, start following them on LinkedIn. Create a conversation with people within the thread of what they're sharing on there. Focus on specific business sectors. All those tools are right there for you. And from from the military aspect, we understand targeting. Well, targeting Mm -hmm. is the same aspect that you're going to apply to looking for your next job or opportunity. And I think the other part about networking that's important is many people think it's sort of like connotates that like you're selling yourself or you're being disingenuine. Well, if that's the aspect of networking that you're thinking about, you've got to make sure that you break that because you cannot network successfully unless you are your authentic, genuine self. And that will really come out in the conversations, relationships you make. And, you know, when I would go to networking events prior to my transition, I had a number of friends. They were influential people that took me to, you know, cocktail parties, rubbing elbows with very influential people. And I told them, I said, please do not introduce me as ex Navy SEAL or SEAL Master Chief or anything other than Bob Newman. And 
I did that intentionally because I wanted to be able to lead in and build those connections with my own story and my own values and principles and who I was as a human being, not what it was that I did in the military. And, you know, it wasn't intentional in that aspect, but what I found from that engagement, Lucas, is like, I really enjoyed about halfway through these engagements or parties that people would come up to me after they found out from somebody else who I was and what I'd done. They go like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And this was amazing. And, and so that kind of like helped me build some trust and rapport and that I wasn't trying to throw some street cred out there right out the get go. You know, I'm not ignorant. I know that I got my foot in a lot of the doors because of my background, right? Like I, I knew that was a part of my story, uh, but I really wanted to kind of project myself into those environments and not necessarily what it was that I did. And it comes down to that narrative and, and you being able to pick the right story for the right time, right environment, and, and being comfortable with that story too. Um, it feels very scripted when you have something in front of you that's not who you are and the listener and the person you're speaking with across the room will really understand that. And then that connection's lost. So yeah. like Bob said, being able to be authentic in your story and embrace it, it's critical. Yeah. And then the last thing I'd like to share is that like, you know, in the military, we love to be in service to others. And I can tell you that I get no better fulfillment. 90% of the time, I'm not using my network for myself. It's when I have somebody that reaches out or I get an understanding of someone's interest or what they're looking for. And I know someone in my network that I can do the introduction to. And I just absolutely love that. And to me, that's the most important part of my network is being able to use my network for others. Um, and, and, you know, that way I, I can feel very um, comfortable making these connections and introducing myself to people because it's not about me being self-interested at all. It's really is about helping others. And it uh, looks like Kevin Henry, he's joined us here today in the chat, laid off from my post-military job and it was my network that presented a new and better employment opportunity within days. Grateful for the network I built when I didn't think I needed it. And you hear that a lot, build the network before you need it. Uh, don't wait for it to start raining. Uh, to look for your boat. Uh, looks like Byron Lewis, getting ready to get out of the Marine Corps. Transition phase is hard. Being a part of an organization for 20 plus years while operating at a set level, then having to give that up causes some stress. This is all great information you guys are providing to help with stress. Uh, Byron, glad you could join us. Uh, next thing, probably the, uh, the, the biggest issue, uh, the biggest concern um, uh, that most veterans have, and probably the one that uh, I had as I was transitioning out was employment. I mean, you spend 18 or 20 or 25 years uh, in uniform and you know where your next paycheck is coming and you know how much it's going to be and you know when your next promotion is coming. And it's all very simple and it's easy and it's a warm blanket of financial predictability. But uh, when you when you hang up the boots, uh, you hang up a flight suit, uh, you, 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 you park the, the gear uh, down in the basement somewhere, it, you leave that that, uh, that warm blanket of, of financial uh, readiness behind. So let's, let's talk for a second about employment. What advice do you have to offer uh, some folks that are heading out to the employment sector and uh, what trends are you seeing um, with folks coming out of the soft community in particular? Yeah, I'll take that. So part of, part of what we do at the Honor Foundation is being able to build bridges to opportunities for uh, the men and women we serve so they can begin exploring uh, careers that they may have a real passion in where they're going to be able to use their skills at a high level every day and, and have that happiness and love showing up to what they're doing. Um, one of the items that I see right now happening and trending is when we're looking at job profiles and job descriptions, um, it's the idea that I don't have everything that's required for the job. And what I love about what my background has been in the private sector is I'm able to and the rest of our organization is able to effectively translate what that business acumen is into what the careers of the soft individual has been. And we're able to just create this new language where we're highlighting all of the strengths and the skills and the expertise so we can consider a career in the field of, say, financial services or entrepreneurship. Um, and that's what I do love about it. I think right now the obstacle is I don't have everything on that job description as the requirements, so I can't apply. No, absolutely apply for those jobs if you are interested to learn more about the company and that's the job you want because it can fit you. Um, but it's being prepared to be able to better understand it. So not rushing 
and applying and much like we just talked about networking and LinkedIn, it's really finding the right individuals who could help influence this process for you as well. And I think that's a real gap right now is um, going through applicant tracking systems. It's, it's great. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're going to get the interview. It really is about creating the right relationship where you're able to share your stories, highlight your strengths and skills, and show that great value you will provide to an organization if that's where you want to go. Bob, what's your take on it? Though? Yeah. So I just like add to like your last point about like, don't rely on the application. This just goes back to the networking importance of it. You know, you know, I, many, many opportunities out there for our veterans are not happening through the direct apply button. You know, it is through that networking relationships that you build to get in the door there. Um, and one of the other things that's trending is, too, is a lot of companies have gotten wise to the talent pool that they get from the veteran community. So they're setting up their own veteran hiring networks and membership, you know, and, and um, you know, assemblies of veterans in their organizations that kind of help them circulate that pool and look for talent in there. And the other trend we're hearing too a lot is that like most companies where veterans want to kind of gravitate to, they understand that they would they would rather hire character over talent any day of the week. And they know they can confidently hire our veterans. So like when you're applying to these positions and when you're networking with folks, understand that they value you for who you are more than what it is that you're currently doing or what your skill set is. Many companies have training programs, as I mentioned earlier, those veteran um, affiliations, they have their own network of getting you ready to interview, go through their you know internship process and get onboarded for, for a lot of those companies. And that includes just an example is if a company has four verticals they manage, a lot of these veterans initiatives, they're basically allowing you to spend a quarter in each one of those verticals so you can select which one is going to align best with you and then select placement after there. And there's many firms doing out there to, that, that out there today. And it takes so it, time. It takes a, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, finding the right organization, the right role, the right next adventure, it, it takes time. It's not going to happen in a weekend. So really dedicating dedicating a few hours every week to focus on it. I think that's really important. So uh, I guess what I'm hearing is, you know, there, there really are more options out there for Navy SEALs other than a uh, t-shirt company, create a workout program or write a leadership book. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. I just had to throw that out there. And you forgot acting and directing. And uh, I mean, this is blowing up like crazy. Pers yeah, yeah. Personal security. Hey, nobody does Navy SEALs better than Charlie Sheen. I'm sorry. Hands down. <laughs> when you when you can jump out of a moving Jeep into a body of water at 65 miles an hour, you just you can't. It doesn't get any better. Oh, man, that's some nostalgia. Jeez. Is it? And I'm, I'm sure that's something that they train at Ed Buds. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll tell you what uh, it's. It's, it's a great subject matter. I want to just talk for a second because we've got we've got some time here. I want to talk for a second about culture, about organizational culture, about military culture, because when you and I were chatting, uh, the three of us were chatting last week, uh, I made my my uh, my typical, my usual joke about the knife hand. All right. This this knife hand has served me well. And now I understand in the civilian world. I have to holster this thing. I can't use it to direct. I can't use it to emphasize a point. Uh, I'm not allowed to get it out there. People don't appreciate the knife hand. That's my personal example of cultural differences. Have you, have you got a few tips for our transitioning mill spouses and service members on cultural adaptability? I think, you know, from the spouse lens, looking at the different industries that I've worked in and had to jump from, I think the important part is holding true to your values and what's important to you as, as an individual, whether it's as a as a, a woman, as a man, as a mother, spouse, what, what that looks like. But finding the organizations that you read their company values um, and they strike you. It really is something that I'm going to get behind because this is how I live my day. Um, this is how I model my activities and my behaviors. I think that's critically important when you're looking at a company culture. And then, like Bob said, finding those individuals and doing your company research, talking to people and really see if those values come out in those conversations. I think it's one thing to read um, company values or, or read on a website, life at, and hear these um, incredible testimonials. But when you actually can sit down or over Zoom, talk to somebody who's lived there at that organization, you learn so much more. So I think for, for a military spouse, I think the values are that you hold every day is critically important when you're looking at the organization that you're gonna move towards. 
And uh, hey, Bob, and, and before you uh, attack that, um, Christian says nobody does Navy SEALs like a Navy SEAL. Uh, thank you for that feedback. Thanks, Christian. And yeah, Christian, uh, I'll get I'll get the note over to uh, to Charlie Sheen that he's been bumped. Bob, <laughs> culture. Talk yeah, so kind of building on that knife hand example that you give there, right? Like, you know, you got to be cautious, right? In today's environment, you just call it what it is. Is like there are. I guess the way I would ask you to look at this as a veteran is that like you represent a group larger than yourself, just as you did mm -hmm. when you served in the military. So recognize you're not just representing yourself. If you say something offhanded or maybe you're being aggressive, like you would be in the platoon space or something of that nature, mm -hmm. you're actually sort of representing the rest of the military, you know, veterans, yeah, especially point. in your organization. So if you wouldn't, the rule we always used to say in the team room is like, if you wouldn't say it to your grandmother, don't say it in here. Right. And I think you can kind of take that knife hand sort of analogy back to, you know, your business place. And the other thing is like, you know, seek understanding within your new environment, that new tribe that you've aligned with and give them the time to understand you as a veteran too. You know, so if you use an acronym or if you have some verbiage that they're not familiar with, don't just like roll your eyes and move on or say like you wouldn't understand because that's how rude is that? Like, actually, if they asked or said that they didn't understand, it's because they probably want to understand what that comes mm -hmm. from. Because what I've found is many people that have never experienced the military, they understand that they really only have the experience of it from what they see on TV or they read in the book. So when they have someone right in front of them that can share an experience um, or talk about what this means to be your, you know, your, your, your brother's keeper or be a battle buddy or what have you it was important for them to learn that from you. And I think take the time to help people understand that, that aspect, um, you know, and then through your process of transitioning out, try and get rid of some of the acronyms. Cause you're going to learn a whole bunch of new ones in the business world. Cause they say a bunch of them that I have to be like, could you explain that to me? Because I don't know what a TRA statement is. Yeah. Yeah. I think at once at one point in time, somebody in my, uh, in my, my workplace asked me what I had planned for the evening. I said, rack ops. And they, just, <laughs> they just, they just looked at me and they're like, what? I'm like, I'm just going to go get some sleep. Never mind. All right. All right. So, hey, it's a transition. It's a pro it's called a transition, not 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 so much a change because you don't go from zero to one. It takes time and it takes effort and you have to be deliberate about it. All right. Rolling into our last question, the same question I ask of all my victims, excuse me, of my guests. Um, imagine that you have a transitioning service member, a transitioning mill spouse uh, in an elevator. You've got 30 seconds, just 30 seconds to give them a piece of advice. What advice would you give? Lindsay, you're up first. Oh, all right. I'm up first. 30 seconds. Okay. So I would say have courage and tell your story. Um, your words are extremely powerful. You've been in such uh, diverse communities and experiences that leverage those experiences to highlight your strengths and your skills and your values, highlight your passions. I think we all have an opportunity to create those inspiring moments for individuals we meet along the way. Um, and be open to exploring what a new passion could be for you too. Don't go uh, into conversations with the biases of one industry over another. Go in very open-minded and be willing to um, embrace and accept the challenges and the opportunities that come your way. Awesome. Bob, your one piece of advice. Yeah. So like, you know, in our military service, we were part of something larger than ourselves. Team before self was something we said all the time, you know, in the platoon space. During your transition time, it's time for you to take care of yourself first. Taking care of yourself, oh. focusing on yourself is not a bad thing and it's not selfish. It's taking care of your family, those around you, and your future employment. And one of the things I would say during my career development boards when I was the command master chief is sometimes the hardest person to be honest with in the room is yourself. And so take the time to learn about yourself and not be on this linear path of what other people's expectations are of you. Learn the values about yourself and what you want to do in your next chapter of your life um, and then apply that and stay true to it. And then you'll have a very fulfilling transition. Bob, I couldn't have said it better myself. Lindsay, all, all great advice. Um, Bob, Lindsay, before we get going, uh, I understand there's some great things on the horizon for the, uh, for the honor foundation. Could you share those with us before we go? Yeah. So uh, I, you know, Bob and I are very happy. I mean, we're, we're eight years old as an organization and in a few short weeks, we're kicking off eight campuses. So this is really exciting for us because we are serving more um, soft men and women than ever before. Um, we are just opening our new campuses down in Tampa and in Eglin, and we're going to have a second virtual campus as well. And then our physical campuses at San Diego, 
Virginia Beach, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, and Fort Bragg area. Um, we're just really looking forward to a, a great three-month cohort experience with the men and women where we're going to serve as trusted partners to them and their families. Yeah. And with that expansion, you know, we're going, I mean, we're, we're providing executive level training, a three-month course to our transitioning veterans. And so we bring on the world-class facilitators. And so as we've grown and expanded, we're looking forward to growing our, our base of facilitators, executive coaches, and everybody else on board the team and providing these services to everybody that served in soft at some large capacity during their career. That's fantastic. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, great show today. Great uh, advice. And uh, I hope we've, we've delivered some uh, advice and some guidance and some wisdom to the folks in the audience uh, to help make their transitions better. And uh, for our audience, hey, if you're looking for a job, and you haven't already done so, head over to www.recruitmilitary.com. All right. 400,000 jobs with over 6,000 employers. Recruit Military is on a mission to help transitioning service members and mill spouses find meaningful employment opportunities. On behalf of Recruit Military and the folks that joined us today, thank you very much, Bob and Lindsay. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank, thank you, you so much, Lucas. And be sure folks out there in internet land to tune in next week where I demonstrate the importance of work-life balance by not doing a show. Yes, I'm going on vacation. But the week after that, we will be hosting Matt Lewis, veteran and accomplished author. And he'll be talking transitions. It should be fun. Uh, you won't want to miss it. Until then, this has been Lucas Conley for Recruit Military Live. Good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>